Tesla's up 4% on the news that Rivian is up 6%. (laughs) What do you think about the news that CATL will be cutting prices by half? That's obviously a positive. Um, I don't know if that affects long-term valuation because I don't know if those prices are what you can assume long-term. Wes in live chat says, supply chain and bomb costs dropping as they go to larger scale also could be key customers lowering contracts and thus softening of price. Omar, do you think we're going to see a margin benefit? Yeah, I think it's obvious there's going to be benefits to COGS this year. I mean, this is crazy what's happening in China. And... CATL is Tesla's largest supplier, so it should cut um, around three hundred thousand dollars of cost out of the standard range models right away. Yeah, I just want to say so. This CATL thing seems to be getting blown out of proportion. I've been looking to the reporting for it. It's actually all based on a CNEV uh, post article that was based on a report out of China from the outlet Thirty Six KR. And all they've really said is that what's happening is there's a price war in China right now between BYD and CATL. They're all over capacity. They're trying to get rid of cells. Um, and so there's a fire cell on the uh, the lower end cells that CAL, the CATL produces. These are like two, 2C like uh, fast charge cells. They're not high qual- quality cells. This is basically they're trying to say like we're over capacity. Anyone who wants these can take them. And so you have these low end Chinese companies that are coming in that are a lot of these companies are, you know, facing bankruptcy. These are like uh, NADA. This is like HiFi was, you know, you guys have heard HiFi just went bankrupt. But a lot of these smaller companies that are kind of ready to go bankrupt in China right now can't afford these cells. And so CATL is making special concessions for them. This is not a like they're not maintaining margins on these. They are giving them away basically like at cost. I mean, there, this isn't really like some one-off thing where it's like this one battery cell is being sold and then prices are going to bounce back up. What we're really seeing in China is, you know, first of all, just a struggling capital market uh, environment where the property bubble has really sort of weakened things. You've got a weak stock market. This has resulted in, you know, persistent decline in producer prices and commodity prices have been dropping like a rock, right? So when commodity prices come down, commodity prices were very high during the pandemic. When they come down, that delivers sustained, uh, you know, COGS benefits to both the battery makers and to the EV makers ultimately, right? So you look at the price of lithium, for example, it shot up. Now it's back down to earth. This is a good thing. Is it going to shoot up back to pandemic levels again? No, it's not going to shoot up back to pandemic levels again. So, and then, you know, generally there's just sort of a deflationary environment in China. And yeah, a lot of people aren't buying these batteries. There is overcapacity. All of that's true, but it has the effect of pushing battery prices downward. So, yeah, I think... This is really consistent when you look at the long term trend for like the last 10 years, it's the battery cost declines are pretty much right on trajectory. There was a little blip during the pandemic when battery prices shot up a little bit, but we've really seen, you know, over a decade, massive, massive decreases in the cost per kilowatt hour. And I don't think anyone was imagining that you'd be able to get any kind of battery pack for $56 a kilowatt hour, um, you know, right now. I think Tony Siba was projecting this, w- you know, it would hit that level by the end of 2024. It actually happened a year early. First of all, I would like to say to Sasha, thank you for standing up and bringing credible information to the space. <clears throat> Otherwise, you would have some of the over-optimistic saying things like, this is going to reduce prices by $300,000, which I believe Omar said, which I my brain can't process. I must have somehow misunderstood. Um, but I said $3,000. Right. And still, he's wrong. Notice he didn't update. How is that wrong? Because they're not getting these cells. 
these are two C cells limit. Tesla's not buying this crap. You may be right that there's going to be second order effects on overall demand for all lithium ion phosphate cells. And eventually downstream that reduce prices a bit. But he explicitly gave information that these are not cells that are being sold to Tesla. Tesla is not buying these cells. Tesla is not getting directly these cost reductions right now. So I think that's kind of important. I mean, there, it's it's just not the case that there's like one kind of battery that's being discounted and other types of batteries aren't being discounted. When commodities fall, okay, so batteries are made of lithium, they're made of nickel, they're made of cobalt. When the prices of these commodities fall, the price of making any battery falls, okay? Not just one type of battery, not just a shitty battery, any battery, okay? And if there's a shitty battery that gets cheaper, the better batteries have to get cheaper too. I mean, I don't think anyone can argue with this. There's a long-term, you know, decline in battery prices. And like, uh, they're saying uh, a battery, a 60 kilowatt hour battery that costs manufacturers 6,776 today will cost 3,338, saving EV manufacturers $3,000 per vehicle. I just went on Amazon and I'm ordering Hey, a Gumby doll. You remember those things? The name Gumby? You could stretch them all over the place. He's green. I ordered one, and I'm going to stitch Omar's face uh, to the top of the Gumby doll and then send it to him because he's able to stretch himself in all sorts of configurations to try to hold on to his point, no matter how much it's failing. So, What case, are you talking say, about? Like, what is see, not true here? Are battery costs not declining? Am I crazy? Is you, everybody who's writing about this crazy? Like, what are you trying to say here? I don't get it. We Tesla is not getting suddenly 50% off on their LFP cells. That's what I'm not, saying. I didn't say they're not suddenly, but the cost of batteries is declining. You see, you can't even correct yourself. You can you cannot do it. It's it's not coded in. It's like Google has taken control of your brain and they've hard coded in the in, in, inability for you to say that you were wrong. What was I wrong about? They're not getting saving $3,000 suddenly. I didn't car. say they were saving $3,000 suddenly. Why would it be sudden? This has been a continued thing that's been happening every quarter. You I mean, they're putting slides it. in their deck. Cogs are going down. Where do you think that's coming from? you were insinuating that this price reduction from CATL was going to lead to a $3,000 savings per car. And we now know that that's no, not going to happen over the right next now. 12 months, $3,000. That's what the article I'm quoting says, the article we're talking about. Which doesn't actually apply to Tesla because they're not buying those cells. No, CATL is Tesla's biggest supplier, and BYD is a Tesla supplier too. They're buying batteries from both of these companies. Google, can you fix the software bug, please? You know, I guess, um, like, one way maybe you guys are both right is if Tesla was um, negotiating lower prices than the smaller players, and had already captured a portion of these savings that CATL is passing on to smaller players now, that could have been reflected in the previous quarter, like Q4 results. And maybe in the next few quarters, we're going to see further reductions in battery costs for Tesla specifically, but not as much as $3,000 per car. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, and, this, and I guess the, re the reason why I kind of brought this up is because kind of clarify that distinction, because... The CFO on the last earnings call pointed out voluntarily that this past quarter savings aren't going to continue at that pace, although we can expect some further reductions in COGS. Right, Machine? Yeah, correct. This was already explicitly stated on one of the earnings. Um, so I expect it to go down, sure. Uh, and it will track with decreases in the uh, you know lithium iron phosphate prices or the lithium prices as they've been going down. Um, but $3,000 is, is quite a big leap in my, um, estimation.
Yeah. You know, maybe we should start putting some numbers around what we expect COGS per unit to be on the vehicle side uh, for Q1. Do you have an estimate on that machine? No, how much it's going to decrease quarter over quarter? No, I'm looking for absolute because I know you haven't looked up the number for Q4. Yeah, you're right. I haven't. Of course I haven't. You have no idea. This is going to be kids. another, you're going to be like $40,000. I'm like, dude, we're already below 40. It's well, going to be another we're NVIDIA. What are we it's, going to, it's going to be another NVIDIA $2 trillion situation. This is, yeah. <laughs> you're trying to make me look bad and blowing something out of proportion. I don't have to try. You already did that to yourself that day. <laughs> Anyways, yes, I don't know what the cogs are currently exactly, uh, but I would say the because I think there's like thirty five, thirty six thousand, um, and whatever the cost reduction was between Q three and Q four, I believe that cost reduction the next the, over the next quarter will be half. Yeah, this is kind of continuation of um, the Tesla valuation discussion from Friday. You know, we, you and I were focused on FSD take rate increasing being the primary driver of a valuation increase. And Joey was, um, you know, very adamant about Tesla automotive. And maybe if Tesla automotive cogs per unit come down a little bit, do you think that alone can propel the stock to $1 trillion valuation? No, I don't think so, um, because those sell costs help Tesla, but it also helps other EV makers, who, of course, are much worse overall at making EVs cost effectively, but ultimately means uh, from an investor standpoint that there's going to be competitors long term and that Tesla is not going to be able to maintain much higher, high margins long term. Um, like that's not going to happen. Tesla, you know, outside of the software aspect. And so it's not a long-term benefit unless what's a long-term benefit to Tesla is 4680, their own proprietary cells being better. That's something that could change the valuation of the company. If they're able to produce those more cost effectively, or obviously having specs that are superior to competition, things that aren't provided or around and available to other OEMs, I, I think that's something that can substantially affect the stock. Now, right now, it doesn't seem like 4680 is, a, is cost effective. And, uh, you know, so two to be determined. While you were talking, I did a quick envelope, back of the envelope calculation on COGS per unit. I took total deliveries, subtracted those subject to operating lease accounting, which is 474,000 units. And then I took the automotive COGS. That gave me about $36,300, $36,300 per vehicle. Is that the number you have as well, machine? I have 36,299. Good. Okay. All right. Good. And so it was you, about 39,500 in Q4 2022. Okay. So you guys think we can go below 35,000 next quarter? No. Why not? I think that in 12 months, they could be at 33,000. There's a path there when you look at the deflationary environment in China for sure. And I'm not sure management really forecasted the severity of this situation. Like, this is what I'm trying to say. This isn't some one-off sale, okay? This is a deflationary environment that is pushing prices down fast. Joseph Foster, you may unmute yourself and go ahead. I got a question in regards to those battery costs. Do you think there's a world where the non-Tesla US-based EV makers basically punt on their domestic battery production, end up buying from cattle, BYD, 
and Tesla ends up being the only ones that are actually getting the government incentive money for domestic production. It seems like they're downsizing. I mean, they're canceling their EV programs. Well, right. But I mean, if they're going to push back their actual there isn't their really much production. Yeah, sorry. There isn't really much domestic uh, production from the legacy automakers. Ford isn't doing any. Ultium, which is a partnership between GM and LG, meaning LG is really doing most of it, has been kind of a disaster. They haven't really been able to produce much at all. So there aren't really many domestic battery efforts to abandon. Most of the legacy auto EVs that are sold are already using Asian batteries. Machine? Yeah, I was going to say something similar. That the only ones who are able to build batteries are the Chinese battery makers and Tesla, and I guess uh, maybe North Northvolt, right? In in Europe, are producing some. Like, there's not that many uh, independent companies that produce batteries. And even Ford, he was going to partner with Cattle. I don't know if that's still on or if they gave up. Right to build batteries in the U.S., so I think you're going to get battery production in the U.S. still, but it might be uh, some Chinese partnerships or uh, Korean, and I think that will continue because the U.S., you know, with the um, with the bill, was trying to motivate to get these things built in the U.S. Uh, I don't know so much with Europe; I don't think they have any um, subsidies right now. So I think in the U.S. they will continue to build, but you're right. I mean, it's not going to be uh, anyone else other than the Chinese and Tesla, I think, and, and the Koreans. Wes? Yeah, there. as far as I'm aware, there's no national production other than Tesla. So for these other companies to have that, it, that, that doesn't seem likely. So, Machine, did you say no on the 35,000 per unit COGS for next quarter? Correct, because I believe you're saying over 1,000 reduction quarter over quarter. And I don't remember what it was in Q3, but I, I don't think it was like over $2,000 reduction quarter over quarter. So I don't let, think it's gonna... let me just calculate that real quick. 37,500. So we went from 37,500 to 36,300. So you're saying it's going to be about half of that. Um, right. So it went down $1,200. And you're thinking it's going to go down at least $1,300 the next quarter of a quarter. And I think, no, it's going to be less based on uh, what they indicated on their earnings. Yeah, so it's going to be somewhere between 35 to 36, you're saying. Correct. And I guess that depends on how well the, you know, Model 3 Highland production ramp is going at Fremont and Cybertruck production ramp is going at Giga Texas. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into COGS, right? We, we keep talking about it, assuming um, an equivalent mixture of vehicles and you know short range versus long range and those things have changed over time that also contribute to cog reductions so you're right i don't know what the the absolute level is going to be um because you could the cog but everything i'm thinking right now on the top of my head would indicate cogs would drop less if not go up a little bit because you do have cyber truck ramping although it's still very low volume you have the Model 3 uh, in the U.S. not really being produced much yet. And so, yeah, they've raised the price a little bit, but that's just because they're not producing many, according to Troy. And so there's going to be lower deliveries of Model 3 this quarter, which means and that should have the lowest uh, COGS, right? I mean, still lower than Model Y. I don't know if we know that for sure, though. Um, and so it's possible... Than the no, I would think well. the Model Y COGS per unit currently is less than Model 3 Highland COGS per unit, right? I mean, Highland has a lot of content. Well, I'm not even talking about, mo right, but uh, Highland. You were talking about what Model 3 was last quarter and what its COGS were 
are, are now out of the equation, right? And so it's being replaced with, on average, maybe higher cogs. Okay. So basically, until Cybertruck gets to about 200,000 a year production rate, 4,000 a week or more, we shouldn't expect further cogs per unit reductions or any major, any material cogs per unit reductions. Lithium prices um, declined substantially through throughout 2023. But according to the chart, lithium carbon price I'm looking at, they've been stable since then, just below 100,000 UN per ton. But I mean, that alone is going to re- lead to hundreds of dollars per unit of COX reduction, right? So maybe in the next, even though Cybertruck deliveries are going to increase quarter over quarter and Model 3 Highland probably has higher COGS per unit than Model Y and that's increasing as well. So the mix is shifting towards COGS per unit until those two products ramp to volume production, even though that is true for the next couple of quarters, raw material prices are dropping substantially, have dropped substantially in, in recent months and that's going to be reflected in Q1. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, right? Does that make sense? Yep. Omar, are we on the same page? Yeah, I think that there's no doubt that the raw materials costs and a lot of things are coming down for the vehicle. I think when management made comments about the pace of COGS growth slowing, they're mainly talking about the introduction of these new models and sort of the headwinds that come from ramping them. So, for example, you know, Cybertruck ramping that as they get more deliveries out, Model 3, that may have a bit of a headwind, right? They may not, you know, they're sort of ramping up and they may not be getting as good of a price as they might when they get these vehicles to higher volumes. But I think when you just sort of control for that, you look at sort of the raw materials cost themselves, they're moving in a very good direction. And once those vehicles are ramped, which we know they will be within 12 to 18 months, and that sort of headwind is out, then I think you could see a pretty sharp COGS reduction that sort of, you know, reveals a lot of the underlying strength of what's been happening with this deflationary pressure we've been seeing. Did you close close out your NVIDIA position? No, I still have it. Um, we'll see. I'm not well, going to hold for that long, but maybe a few more weeks. We'll see. The range of estimates for this company is kind of crazy. I mean, there are people, Gene Munster of Loop Ventures is saying price targets below a thousand are going to, um, what did he say? Look foolish or something along those lines. And he's okay with more than a thousand price t- targets, he said. I think you said 800, 2 trillion, right? And that's where we are right now. And you sold half of your position, I think? Yeah. No, I think it might get closer to 900. Um, I mean, that's probably when I would sell. I mean, otherwise, I'd just sell in a few weeks, anyways. But, I, you know, I, I don't, how does anyone know for sure? I, I, again, you have to have a lot more expertise than I do on the supply chain and demand backlog for their products and understanding the supply increase of competitors' products and when those things are all gonna meet and actually affect uh, NVIDIA in having to you know, reduce their, co- reduce their prices, I, I, just, I just don't know exactly when that's gonna happen, right? And so, or if it ever does enough to actually reduce their profits versus not growing as much. And that's going to ultimately affect, I could totally see NVIDIA. There's definitely a, a case that NVIDIA's, you know, goes to three, tri- three trillion. Like I, that's definitely possible, uh, but it would have to be borne out over quarter, over quarter of uh, increasing earnings and no, uh, visibility of a slowdown and we're all speculating each time that the slowdown is going to happen but no one believes it's going to happen yet right i don't think anyone is thinking 
next quarter, there's going to be a slowdown. So it's just when does the market anticipate enough ahead of time, if, if they do. I feel I'm just talking in circles. Well, we have all three speakers right now are NVIDIA bulls. I think they, I think you all have NVIDIA positions, right, Wes? Yep, I do. Now, Meta, who's not here right now, Meta was saying that if there is a software breakthrough on the inference or the training side that dramatically reduces demand for compute, that could be a major risk for NVIDIA stock. What do you think about that? I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. First of all, what is this breakthrough that suddenly slashes the cost of, you know, training computer, the amount of compute needed? And, you know, if such a thing were to happen, I think it would just actually increase the demand for training, right? If you could train a model with a fraction of the compute, it would just mean the models would perform so much better. And it would probably actually just cause people to invest more in training compute. I was going to say, uh, I agree with Omar on the induced demand aspect for for training. I don't think the training demand is going to go down because they're, if it, they reduce cost, people are just going to buy more and they're going to train more. The inference is a little bit different because I, you have so many uh, devices or amount of rounds of inference that you want to do. I think those aren't necessarily going to cause induced demand from lower price. They are also going to do more rounds of inference. So in theory, if you reduced the cost of doing inference, I think it would just, yeah, reduce the um, purchase of inference chips in theory. Um, and NVIDIA did say that inference is like 40% of their business, so it's substantial. So in theory, that could affect their uh, overall revenue, you know, revenue and, and margins. Obviously, a 50% reduction in compute costs for inference is a drastic thing that we can't assume will happen uh, instantaneously. Uh, and not, nothing would be instantaneous. Even if they discovered something that did that, it would take a long time for people to convert their models and whatnot. But, but so in theory, yes, in practice, uh, probably going to have a minor effect. You don't know that. I mean, it's possible it could be major or minor. It could be near term or longer term. It could take time to convert models. Maybe you don't need to do as much work to convert models, right? Either way, you're making an assumption. I am making assumptions, but my assumptions are probabilistic, whereas Meta likes to assume the extreme. So it's like no probability, it's binary. Uh, so no, I don't think costs are going to go down 50% and margins are going to go down, your revenue is going to go down 50% on the inference portion. That's too drastic. But I do get his point um, directionally. Yeah, I mean, if you just look at what this thing is doing, it's just going up like a rocket ship. Like people are buying more and more of these things. And I mean, it just shows, shows no signs of shopping, uh, stopping. You can get these, these chips, these training computers, and you can train a model that can provide, you know, potentially insane amounts of economic value, or at least that's the thinking, right? Tesla can buy these, they can take their data, and they can train FSD. So I think the machine, the point machine makes about inference is interesting because they did say that 40% of their sales are now for the inference. So they're using these chips for inference. One thing that I think could threaten that is not necessarily a more efficient algorithm or anything like that, but just actually on device inference. Like for example, if Apple Silicon really makes this a focus, you know, they already have a neural engine that hardware accelerates inference. If in the future more inference is done on device and less is done in the cloud, that could potentially impact the 40% of their data center sales that are for inference. But, you know, even if on device did take a bigger and bigger chunk, I would probably expect, you know, their inference sales to just keep growing just because there are so many data center applications.
machine, would you like to talk to um, the technicals of the NVIDIA stock in the shorter term? I know you watch those things closely. I, I'd have to look at the, the current numbers, but their you know, forward P ratio is not super high. Um, if you if you expect them to earn twenty dollars per share this year, then their P ratio will end up being forty. But they've already earned about five dollars in this first quarter, or excuse me, Q four. I don't know when their when their quarter ends. They might be on a different calendar. And it sounds like they is expect for the next few quarters at least. Um, earnings to go up so you're probably looking at 20 i don't know i'm gonna guess like 25 dollars in earnings uh per share this year and if you look at the current stock price it's just below uh 800 it's like 793 793 divided by 25 gives you a p ratio of 31 so the question i think that's going to be a reasonable value if you said the price of nvidia stayed flat all year and at the end of the year they had a p ratio of 31 32 uh, i don't think people would think it's overvalued and then they would also be looking at how much are they still growing so i could definitely see a scenario where the price goes down from here if the market group thinks and, and it happens that they're not growing as much as they have been um, or they actually start, you know, lose, you know, shrinking their earnings. But if they're still showing earnings growth in the latter half of this year, they will not be getting a P ratio of 30. Um, it will be higher. And let's say they allowed a P ratio of 40. That's still 25% higher than where we are today. And that would put you over $1,000 uh, share price. So, like... <sighs> It's hard for me to estimate, you know, in shorter term, like in the next few months, I do believe we could get to 900 and then pull back. I mean, it could just go down from here as well. I do think probably at some point over the course of this year, it will pass the thousand dollars because I do believe, and let's say when their next earnings reports comes out and they're growing earnings even more still, which I think is kind of guaranteed, um, that will probably put the market, um, push it over a thousand if only temporarily. I asked you about technicals. You talked about forward PE. That is, that's a, that's not a technical. I hate to break it to you. That's a fundamental. Well, metric. I don't look at, I'm not looking at RSI. RSI, I'm sure is saying it's way overbought. Um, I don't plot lines. You know, this is funny. People like want to look at RSI. Like, and you can use these indicators. Like I use them some, but do you really think RSI and drawing lines between the bar charts over time is predictive. Meanwhile, you were talking about AI and these insane, massive neural nets that are trying to learn every nuanced detail. And you think you can solve it with a few lines and some simple metrics. So like, I, I, I only believe in the general principle of when things are, uh, too many people are, are, are buying something out of hype and that people want to take profits at some point at different time scales. I do believe in that. Do you have a way of measuring sentiment in a stock? Not personally. I mean, people have indicators of, you know, volume weighted uh, averages of, of purchases, but I think it would be interesting to do more sentiment related analysis where people actually do like NLP analysis of, uh, you know, say on Twitter or Reddit for how people are talking about a certain stock. Um, I've never done that personally. I did try to use it at some point, but I, I don't know. I didn't really get anywhere yet. Um, so personally, no, it's just based on uh, listening to people, right? Listening to what people write and getting a sense there. And I've definitely seen that with Tesla over many periods of time where people are overly bullish. Everyone's like, it's going to the moon because it's going so well already. And they don't want to sell because they're afraid it's going to rocket higher. That's usually a signal that it's overbought. And then meanwhile, 
conversely, when it gets sold off quite a bit, everyone's bearish, even more bearish, right? And it's kind of uh, interesting how mentality works, where when something's already lost so much value, people are then not wanting to buy the stock because they think it's going to keep going down. And uh, I think those are, you know, good psychological uh, metrics to pay attention to. Omar, do you look at any specific met, uh, metrics of technical analysis like the RSI or moving averages or any sort of sentiment analysis? No. It's astrology for men. <laughs> I mean, I think a, a fact like all sell side analysts rating a stock buy is a red flag. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, not necessarily always. I mean, they could say it's a buy because it's a buy, but generally they give it a buy when it goes up and they give it a sell when it goes down. They're kind of useless too. Yeah. I think on Nvidia right now, all but one analyst is rating it buy. One analyst is rating it hold. There's no sells. Let's look through some news. Energy Secretary Grant Home, U.S. on track to meet 50% EV target by 2030, despite slowing growth. BYD Executive on Tesla, quote, Without them, I think the global EV market could not run so rapidly. So we respect them a lot. I think they are a partner and also they are like a way together. We can really help the whole world. Dry Tesla Canada article says first shipment of new Model 3s arrive in Vancouver. SMP Global says, quote, for 2023, the Tesla brand scored Repeat wins for overall loyalty to make, highest conquest percentage, alternative powertrain loyalty, and ethnic market loyalty to make. The U.S. Canadian parse content has been revealed by NHTSA for some of Tesla's 2024 U.S. vehicle lineup. Model 3 rear wheel drive 40%, same as 2023. Model 3 long range 35% versus 75% in 2023. Model Y long range, 70% versus up to 75% in 2023. Model Y performance, 70%, same as 2023. Model S, 65% versus 60% last year. And Model X, 60%, same as 2023. Cybertruck, 65%. Troy replied to Sawyer's post on this topic and said, in the U.S., Model 3 rear-wheel drive uses CATL LFP cells imported from China. Model 3 long-range uses LG2170 cells imported from South Korea. All Model Y versions use Panasonic 2170 cells produced at Giga Nevada. In live chat, Mayal Arsoski asks, what do we know about the speed of charging Tesla cars? Let's say you are close to empty. What's the time to charge 100 miles, 200 miles, full charge? Will this improve over time? The answer to that varies by model and by you know V2, V3, V4 chargers. Depending on where you're standing, what's your state of charges. So, but I think the most important thing that people show, should know about charging Teslas is 90% of charging is done at home. And charging is not a limiting factor. If anybody wants to kind of see how a potential Tesla ownership fits into their daily life, I recommend two roaming a Tesla for a weekend or so, or for a week and coming into work and see how it works for you. But my experience testing my friends' Teslas has been that charging is not an issue. Mile Arsoski also asks, what do we know about profitability of Cybertruck? When do we break even? At what rate of unit production? 
we don't know much about the profitable to Cybertruck at this time, and we're not going to know for a while unless if Tesla tells us. But uh, generally speaking, COGS per unit should be close to that of Model X or slightly lower once Cybertruck reaches volume production. And that means, um, you know, it looks like the line is designed for 250000 a year. So once you exceed 80% capacity utilization for the line, you should start seeing some, um, you know, good numbers, solid, sustainable numbers on COGS per unit side. So that's not going to happen until later this year. And that's in line with Elon's comment that Cybertruck isn't going to contribute materially to Tesla's bottom line um, until uh, that happens, either later this year or early next year. Clay? How does Tesla's in-house design team factor into company valuation? Thank you. In-house design team for vehicles? Oh, for, for chips. Oh. Are you talking about Dojo or are you talking about the FSD computer? I think just generally the in-house chip design team. Well, I mean, it really, it depends, but at the end of the day, it needs to reflect on either a higher revenue growth or a lower cost growth, um, or, you know, more effective training that then translates to higher FSD take rate, for example. So the way to kind of account for uh, value of, you know, a, a piece of um, a company. So in this case, you're isolating in-house chip design. You would do two DCFs, okay? Keep everything the same except for that one variable and see what happens to the intrinsic value of the company. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you think that that Tesla has any possibility of going more generally into AI chip design? I, I know that they're working on Dojo. It's just NVIDIA, they don't manufacture anything. So I'm just wondering what the difference is between NVIDIA having just a really good design team and maybe Tesla has attracted some of the top talent for chip design too. So I'm just trying to figure out essentially what is the difference between what each of those companies' capabilities are? Well, right now, you know, we know for a fact that Tesla team is still relying on NVIDIA chips for training. So unless that changes, having an in-house chip design team is not very valuable. But maybe having an in-house de chip design team in the future will become valuable. Um, in the future, maybe it will allow Tesla to iterate faster, um, bring that functionality in-house, training chips with Dojo. And that if that's the likely future, then having an in-house chip design team is very valuable. But we don't know that for, for sure at this point. Omar, what do you think? Yeah, NVIDIA is kind of like Microsoft in some ways. Like, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but, you know, you think about sort of Microsoft in, let's say, the 90s or the 2000s. It wasn't that they were the only people who could make an operating system. There was the Mac operating system. There had been other operating systems. There was even the Linux operating system, which was available. Anyone could download it for free. So why was Microsoft so powerful? It's really a combination of software factors that just keep, kept people locked into the Windows ecosystem. Pretty much everybody touched Windows in some way. It was very dominant and they extended that dominance into the browser. Then, you know, now every web developer has to be targeting Internet Explorer because it's so big and so on and so forth. Like 
if I want to just go download some model or some data set and train on it, everybody else is sort of using NVIDIA and CUDA. It's kind of the industry standard, right? So if I want to download, let's say, some model of Hugging Face or, or something and uh, inference it or try and train some model, a lot of the tooling, uh, PyTorch, other stuff like that, it's really well optimized for NVIDIA because that's what everybody uses. And NVIDIA is also really optimized for those use cases. So there's been years and years of sort of just building in that NVIDIA ecosystem. It's not that they have any sort of monopoly on, you know, math or parallel computing or training. There may even be, you know, better chip designs, but they just have an incredible amount of momentum. They've got some of the best designers. They've got a great partnership with TSMC and CUDA, their software ecosystem. It's just sort of uh, the industry standard. And of course, that lead can sort of chip away over time. I think Windows, for example, isn't as dominant today. You definitely have the rise of Mac and you have the rise of Linux for sure. Um, but you know, even today, Microsoft Windows remains the number one operating system in the world. So how this market really plays out, it's unclear. But I would, in tech sometimes, there are these sort of network effects. That's the best way I can summarize it. Network effects, right? Tesla enjoys a lot of network effects too. Network effects are when other people using the product have benefits. More and more people get more benefit. Because there's so many Tesla drivers, there's so many superchargers, right? It doesn't mean someone else can't build an EV, but that integration, the hardware, software, everything working together, it benefits from just sort of that momentum. So you see this a lot in tech, um, and it, it's kind of a similar ecosystem lock-in in NVIDIA we have today that you can you know, look at uh, Microsoft or other examples. Yeah, it does. I just... I just wonder if NVIDIA focusing so broadly maybe puts it as a, at a disadvantage versus Tesla designing a chip, let's say, specifically for robotics and real-world AI. That was the argument that Tesla made uh, back when they started Dojo. They said, look, NVIDIA's got so many markets. They got gaming, they got crypto, they've got computer-generated graphics, they've got all this different stuff. And we're just going to focus on training and we can actually make a better trip, uh, better chip than NVIDIA and a better system than NVIDIA because we're just laser focused on training for deep learning. Now, since then, data center applications, mostly training and inference, have become 80 percent of NVIDIA's business. So it is actually becoming kind of their main thing. All of the sales growth we see is really due to this. So. The only thing that can really stop NVIDIA is the AI bubble somehow popping. People somehow realizing that, you know, this is all useless and they just stop caring about the end product. But it, you know, doesn't seem like that's happening right now. It seems like the opposite's happening. We're seeing more and more uses of AI, text to video models, which are going to require more and more computation. Things are headed kind of exploding upwards in AI. Omar, is there a customer concentration for NVIDIA? Can, you know, top two, three cloud players comprise a large percentage of their sales? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got basically Amazon, Amazon AWS number one, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and uh, to a lesser extent, Oracle Cloud. And there's a few other cloud service providers. But these cloud service providers are really buying hundreds of thousands of these chips, and they then rent them out per hour to any startup or any smaller company that can't afford to pay $40,000. So I can go use an H100 for, let's say, $4 an hour or $1 an hour or whatever, and the cloud service provider is buying it just to rent it out. Um, so that's really the bulk of their customers. They never shared that figure though, right? They never shared, say, something like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon make up, you know, 60% of our sales. I guess they should though, in their 10K maybe. I'm sure they have given some commentary on it, um, but I'm not sure I've followed their uh, earnings calls that closely to 
uh, remember anything off the top of my head. I have seen some charts like on X. I'm not sure where they get their data where they show like the amount of H100s per company. I mean, it's not just the cloud service providers. Like obviously there's companies like Tesla, probably movie companies in Hollywood, that kind of stuff who are also doing it. But um, it, it, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than 50% of their sales. You would be or you wouldn't be? I wouldn't be. Oh, wow. And I'm... it was interesting on the last call, they kind of talked about how, oh, a customer comes to us and we actually refer them to the cloud service providers where they can just go get our chips right away. So there's this very kind of synergistic relationship. And then NVIDIA has a product called NVIDIA Cloud. And what they do with the NVIDIA Cloud is essentially just like white label the other cloud products, if that makes sense. So you go to NVIDIA Cloud, you, you're getting an instance in like one of the other cloud providers, but it's through this NVIDIA Cloud interface that only exposes those NVIDIA instances and those other cloud services. So it's a very kind of, you know, like they're trying to really make them happy. You know, they're sending customers their way. They're trying to really like get in bed together because they understand that, let's say Microsoft and, you know, Google has their own TPU chips, for example. You know, let's say Google said, we really want to push the TPUs and not NVIDIA. Then, yeah, that could be, a, you know, a huge issue for them if these major cloud service providers stop. So they're really focused on maintaining good relationships. And for example, Google released their Gemma model and they said it's optimized for NVIDIA. The It was kind of an open source model. You can download the weights and inference it yourself. And it's optimized for NVIDIA. So you can inference it on those NVIDIA chips. It's not optimized for Google TPUs. So I think Jensen recognizes that this is a huge risk and he's tried to manage it very well by uh, cultivating those relationships with those cloud service providers, referring customers their way, and just trying to make it a very loving relationship as much as possible. I found a relevant section on NVIDIA's 10K. It's a, it's a paragraph. Let me read this real quick. Concentration of revenue. Revenue by geographic region is designed based on the billing location, even if the revenue, let's skip that one, geography. Our direct and indirect customers include public cloud, consumer internet companies, enterprises, startups, public sector entities, OEMs, ODMs, system integrators, AIB, and distributors. Now, check this next one out. Sales to one customer, customer A represented 13% of total revenue for fiscal year 2024, which was attributable to the compute and networking segment. One indirect customer, which primarily purchases our products through system integrators and distributors, including through customer A, is estimated to have represented approximately 19% of total revenue for fiscal year 2024, attributable to the compute and networking segment. Our estimated compute and networking demand is expected to remain concentrated. There were no customers with 10% or more of total revenue for fiscal years 2023 and 2022. So it's only in this last fiscal year, 2024, there is one customer that comprises 19% of total revenue. Who do you think that is? Hmm. Probably either Microsoft or Amazon or, yeah, probably either Microsoft or Amazon. I don't know. One of the big cloud service providers, obviously. That's a major risk. So what are NVIDIA's top four customers driving humongous revenue growth, according to some article by published on techovidas.com? Microsoft, 15%. Microsoft, a global powerhouse in software, cloud services, and computing, stands out as one of NVIDIA's top customers, account accounting for a substantial 15% of the revenue, according to this article. But NVIDIA's own 10K says 19%, and it's probably Microsoft, you're right. 
Meta, formerly Facebook, 13%, Amazon, 6 Alphabet, 6 So together, they make about close to half of NVIDIA's revenues. Yeah, like I said, not surprising. Traditional revenue. Now, that's a major risk for NVIDIA. Like for Tesla, that obviously doesn't exist. That risk doesn't exist for Tesla because we have millions of customers and there's not a single customer that comprises, let alone 20%, even 1% of revenues. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think there's also sort of the China factor, the export restrictions against China. So everybody knows that they're still buying H100s and smuggling them somehow. So if there were to be, you know, sort of that were to stop, for example, the authorities figure it out, they crack down, something like that you could see a drop off. I think part of what's fueled this explosive demand is that, and you know, the Chinese companies are extremely competitive in AI. They know that they're not going to be able to get these H100. So they were buying extra quantities of them before those export restrictions kicked in. And, you know, they're still trying to get as many as they can before sort of all the cracks are closed. Longer term, China seems to also now trying to be developing its own chips to compete because if the U.S. is going to have export restrictions and they can't buy NVIDIA chips, NVIDIA is essentially locked out of that market. I mean, this is a huge, like probably some of the best AI talent in the world outside the United States is in China, right? They have all the surveillance and they use AI and they scan the surveillance footage. They can identify your face, figure out who you are, the social credit score. Um, so that's also a risk, I think, that you have a chip emerge from China, that it begins to eat a big part of the market, and that it's even exported across the world and, you know, becomes a competitive threat long term. But all of this stuff is a little bit sort of far out. Like it is a big risk that their customers are just the cloud service providers and it's so concentrated. But do I forecast in, let's say, the next eight quarters, any material change in the cloud service provider strategy regarding NVIDIA chips? Maybe, but probably not, because their customers are really coming to them to get those NVIDIA chips. And they know those customers need them. And if they're not able to deliver the capacity that they're looking for, they know the customer will go to another cloud service provider because there are others and they do have the NVIDIA chips. But if, for example, there was some material slowdown in demand for the cloud products. If the tech companies didn't want as many of those GPU instances and the cloud service providers found themselves in a situation where they have, let's say, 200,000 NVIDIA H100s and only 100,000 are being rented, well, then they may slow down their orders of new systems if that uh, growth isn't what they expected and they're not seeing good utilization of the existing massive fleet of H100s they have. Is Microsoft working on an in-house chip to replace H100s or reliance on NVIDIA? Yes, they are. Where does that project uh, um, stand? Um, in the early stages, I believe. Let me see if I can Google. Can you imagine a headline that indicates Microsoft is around, you know, ready to replace NVIDIA? A 20% slashing of revenues for NVIDIA. I understand you're saying that, you know, this is not, um, it's not gonna happen overnight, but any sort of headline that points to an acceleration of that process, I think would hit the stock materially. Yeah, basically all their biggest customers are trying to get rid of them, you know, so it is kind of an amazing situation. So I went ahead and commented on this Spaces thread with an article, and you can see it's an article from The Verge, one of many similar articles, and they're saying uh, this was from November 2023, so just about, you know, four, 
uh, three, four months ago. Microsoft is finally making custom chips and they're all about AI. The Azure Maya 100 and note that they're called the Azure Maya and, and Azure Cobalt chip. So Azure is the name of Microsoft's cloud service. So they're making their own chips to replace NVIDIA. Um, and it said, the rumors are true. Microsoft has built its own custom AI chip that can be used to train large language models and potentially avoid a costly reliance on NVIDIA. Microsoft has also built its own ARM-based CPU for cloud workloads. Both custom silicon chips are designed to power its Azure data centers and ready the company and its enterprise customers for a future full of AI. So yes, their biggest customers are actively developing solutions to stop being their biggest customers. It's true. So I guess this is Microsoft's dojo, right? Well, in a way, yes. Um, dojo is a system that comprises many, many chips, and this is kind of a chip. So yes, it is like their dojo. Let me read this article, um, see if there's anything in here that we should know about. Microsoft is finally making custom chips, and they're all about AI. The Azure Maya 100 and Cobalt 100 chips are the first two custom silicon chips designed by Microsoft for its cloud infrastructure. The rumors are true. Microsoft has built its own custom AI chip that can be used to train large language models and potentially avoid a costly reliance on NVIDIA. Microsoft has also built its own ARM-based CPU for cloud workloads. Both custom silicon chips are designed to power its Azure data centers and ready the company and its enterprise customers for a future full of AI. Microsoft Azure Maya AI chip and ARM-powered Azure Cobalt CPU are arriving in 2024. On the back of a surge in demand this year for NVIDIA's H100 GPUs that are widely used to train and operate generative image tools and large language models. There is such high demand for these GPUs that some have even fetched more than $40,000 on eBay. Quote, Microsoft actually has a long history in silicon development, explains Ronnie Borkar, head of Azure Hardware Systems and Infrastructure at Microsoft, in an interview with The Verge. Microsoft collaborated on silicon for the Xbox more than 20 years ago and has even co-engineered chips for its Surface devices. These efforts are built on that experience, says Bokar. In 2017, we began architecting the cloud hardware stack and we began on that journey putting us on track to build our new custom chips. The new Azure Maya AI chip and Azure Cobalt CPU are both built in-house at Microsoft. Combined with a deep overhaul of its entire cloud service stack to optimize performance, power, and cost. Quote, we are rethinking the cloud infrastructure for the era of AI and literally optimizing every layer of that infrastructure, end quote, says Borkar. The Azure Cobalt CPU, named after the blue pigment, is a 128 core chip that's built on an ARM Neoverse CSS design and customized for Microsoft. It's designed to power general cloud services on Azure. We've put a lot of thought into not just getting it to be highly performant, but also making sure we're mindful of power management, explains Borkar. We made some very intentional design choices including the ability to control performance and power consumption per core on every single virtual machine. Microsoft is currently testing its Cobalt CPU on workloads like Microsoft Teams and SQL Server, with plans to make virtual machines available to customers next year for a variety of workloads. While Borkar wouldn't be drawn into direct comparisons with Amazon's Graviton 3 servers that are available on AWS, there should be some noticeable performance gains over the ARM-based servers Microsoft is currently using for Azure. 
quote, our initial testing shows that our performance is up to 40% better than what's currently in our data centers that use commercial ARM servers, says Bokar. Microsoft isn't sharing full system specifications or benchmarks yet. Microsoft Maya 100 AI Accelerator, named after a bright blue star, is designed for running cloud AI workloads, like large language models, training, and inference. It will be used to power some of the company's largest AI workloads and Azure, including parts of the multi-billion dollar partnership with OpenAI, where Microsoft powers all of OpenAI's workloads. The software giant has been collaborating with OpenAI on the design and testing phases of Maya. Quote, we are excited when Microsoft first shared their designs for the Maya chip, and we'll work together to refine and test it with our models, end quote, says Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI. Azure's end-to-end -end AI architecture, now optimized down to the silicon with Maya, paves the way for training more capable models and making those models cheaper for our customers. Manufactured on a five nanometer TSMC process, Maya has 105 billion transistors, around 30% fewer than 153 billion found on AMD's own NVIDIA competitor, the MI300X AI GPU. Maya sports our first implementation of the sub 8-bit data types, MX data types, in order to co-design hardware and software, says Bokar. This helps us support faster model training and inference times. Microsoft is part of a group that includes AMD, ARM, Intel, Meta, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm that are standardizing the next generation of data formats for AI models. Microsoft is building on the collaborative and open work of the Open Compute Project, OCP, to adapt entire systems to the needs of AI. Maya is the first complete liquid-cooled server processor built by Microsoft, reveals Bokar. The goal here was to enable higher density of servers at higher efficiencies, because we're reimagining the entire stack. We purposely think through every layer, so these systems are actually going to fit in our current data center footprint. That's key for Microsoft to spin these AI servers up more quickly without having to make room for them to data centers around the world. Microsoft built a unique rack to house Maya server boards in, complete with a sidekick liquid chiller that works like a radiator you'd find in your car or a fancy gaming PC to cool the surface of the Maya chips. Along with sharing MX data types, Microsoft is also sharing its rack designs with its partners so that they can use them on systems with other silicon inside. But the Maya chip designs won't be shared more broadly. Microsoft is keeping those in-house. Maya 100 is currently being tested on GPT 3.5 Turbo, the same model that powers ChatGPT, Bing AI workloads, and GitHub Copilot. Microsoft is in the early phases of development, and much like Cobalt deployment, and much like Cobalt, it isn't willing to release exact Maya specifications or performance benchmarks just yet. That makes it difficult to decipher exactly how Maya will compare to NVIDIA's popular H100 GPU, the recently announced H200, or even AMD's latest MI300X. Bokar didn't want to discuss comparisons, instead reiterating that partnerships with NVIDIA and AMD are still very key for the future of Azure's AI cloud. At the scale at which the cloud operates, it's really important to optimize and integrate every layer of the stack to maximize performance, to diversify the supply chain, and frankly, to give our customers infrastructure choices, says Borkar. That diversification of supply chains is important to Microsoft, particularly when NVIDIA is the key supplier of AI server chips right now, and companies have been racing to buy up these chips. Estimates have suggested 
OpenAI needed more than 30,000 of NVIDIA's older A100 GPUs for the commercialization of ChatGPT. So Microsoft's own chips could help lower the cost of AI for its customers. Microsoft has also developed these chips for its own Azure cloud workloads, not to sell to others like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, and Qualcomm all do. I look at this more as a complementary, not competing with them, insists Borkar. We have both Intel and AMD in our cloud compute today. And similarly, on AI, we're announcing AMD, where we already have NVIDIA today. Infrastructure, and we really want to give our customers the choices. You may have noticed that Maya 100 and Cobalt 100 naming, which suggests that Microsoft is already designing second generation versions of these chips. This is a series. It's not just 100 and done, but we're not going to share our roadmaps, says Bokar. It's not clear how often Microsoft would deliver new versions of Maya and Cobalt just yet. But given the speed of AI, I wouldn't be surprised to see Maya 100 successor arrive at a similar pace to NVIDIA's H200 announcement around 20 months. The key now will be just how fast Microsoft gets Maya into action to speed up the rollout of its broad AI ambitions and how these chips will impact pricing for the use of AI cloud services. Microsoft isn't ready to talk about this new server pricing just yet, but we've already seen the company quietly launch its co-pilot for Microsoft 365 for $30 per month premium per user. Co-pilot for Microsoft 365 is limited to only Microsoft's biggest customers right now, with enterprise users having to commit to at least 300 users to get on the list for its new AI-powered Office Assistant. As Microsoft pushes ahead with even more co-pilot features this week and a Bing chat rebanding, Maya could soon help balance the demand for AI chips that power these new experiences. This article, I should have said at the beginning, was published on November 15, 2023. So three months ago. And NVIDIA stock since then has surged. Since the publishing of this article, NVIDIA stock has gone up from five, 480 to 790. Yeah, it's like an 80% increase. I mean, I think the most damning part of the article was when they had Sam Altman in there. <laughs> I mean, this is really what's been driving the whole industry. So, I mean, you know, NVIDIA has always been kind of a bubble and bust company, right? It's really driven by these waves. So, you know, I think this market's going to grow a lot. Obviously, you know, some of their biggest customers want to um, make their own chips. And I think they, you know, there's no doubt they're going to take a much bigger share of the market. Google says they're doing 90% of their training on TPUs now. Microsoft, absolutely. Apple, Tesla, these companies that are billion dollar companies, they have the resources to develop their own chips. And TSMC will just make chips for anyone. You just have to design it and you give it to them. They'll make it. It's just as good as anyone else's chip. Although I believe they said Microsoft was the five nanometer process. And I believe the H100s, the latest ones, have a three nanometer process. So a little more advanced process, a little more performance there but probably still good enough for Microsoft to train on, given that NVIDIA has 7% margins. I believe uh, Dojo is also a five nanometer. So, you know, there's no doubt that their grip on the market is going to get eroded. I mean, whenever you have something that you're selling for $40,000 at 70% margins, that's just putting a target on your back for the rest of the industry. Like, hey, come after me. Look at these big, fat, juicy margins. And so it's no surprise that Microsoft's doing this, Tesla's doing this, Google's doing this, Sam Altman wants to start a chip company, right? I mean, everybody's sort of coming after them. And some of these efforts will probably work out, some of them won't. But the question is, okay, let's say NVIDIA goes from 80% of the market to 
30% of the market or 20% of the market. Is that share of the market they end up taking, you know, still bigger than where they are today just because of the growth of uh, demand for AI training and inference in general? Yeah. You know, NVIDIA's margins are high right now. They're about 76% in the last quarter gross margin. But they've always been high. Like in the last five years, the average is above 60%. Let's look at yeah. operating margin. So they've been able to stay ahead of customers trying to replace them with in-house projects for many years. They have a track record of doing that. Omar, let me ask you a question. Some people have said that Jensen has been instrumental in riding three waves from gaming to crypto to now AI. Is it Jensen? Because others have said that he just got lucky with GPUs working better than CPUs. Hmm. It's an interesting question. Well, NVIDIA was founded for gaming, right? So when you're gaming, you have to do a number of simple operations on a bunch of pixels. So the screen you're looking at right now, let's say it's, you know, for example, a thousand by a thousand pixels, right? So a thousand by a thousand is a million pixels. So let's say I want to darken the screen. I want to, you know, shade it and then put something over. So I need to figure out what the new color values for all the pixels are. So I may say, okay, take this, uh, take all the pixels and darken them by 20%. So that's an operation, a very simple operation, a very simple math operating operation that I want to apply to a million different pixels at the same time. So they built these chips that are really good for doing massively parallel operations, right? You can think of your screen essentially as a matrix and, you know, just doing matrix math on all these sort of big matrices. Now, it turned out that when crypto happened, you could make you could make those crypto mining operations that are designed to be expensive and uh, computationally difficult. You could just do them a lot faster on a GPU. And uh, then in 2012, what really kicked off this deep learning boom was AlexNet, where Ilya Suskover and uh, Alex and um, Jeffrey Hinton uh, wrote this paper, and they said, "Hey, we can actually, you know, train these neural networks using GPUs, and we can train them really well." So that was a big moment where it was like, "Oh wow, you know, these chips that are good for graphics, they can also be used really for." massively parallelizing the AI training process. And that was a little bit unexpected. I don't think Jensen really foresaw that exactly. It was more just that, you know, the gaming graphics cards were ready. You could buy them at Best Buy. And neural networks had been around for the 50s, but nobody really thought they could be used for anything that serious because CPUs were so slow that you couldn't really train anything. Then when they, uh, with AlexNet, they broke the record on the ImageNet benchmark for image recognition using deep learning on an NVIDIA gaming GPU. Then people said, oh my God, yeah, these GPUs can actually, you know, completely change for deep learning. And that kicked off the whole revolution we're seeing today. What NVIDIA did do that Jensen deserves credit for is develop CUDA. So back when they were only used for um, gaming, he said, look, we're actually going to come up with this CUDA framework, which allows you to do scientific computation. So like really advanced, highly parallelized computation, not just for gaming, but also doing, you know, compute. That enabled the crypto thing and the AI thing. I don't think Jensen necessarily, you know, foresaw that this AI boom or crypto boom would happen. He probably couldn't have even imagined those things when he started NVIDIA as a, you know, computer graphics accelerator. But because of what they did with CUDA and, you know, many people laughed at them and they said, you know, who's going to use a gaming's graphic card for scientific computation? But 
it ended up uh, really being huge for their business. And other companies that make gra graphics cards like um, AMD and those kinds of companies have not really done as well in the computation space, even though they make graphics cards that are pretty similar. So I wouldn't give him credit for predicting crypto or predicting AI, but what I would give him credit for is really uh, just creating the scientific computation framework that allowed any use cases that did emerge to sort of utilize their chips. All right. Any questions, comments, please request to speak. Otherwise, we're going to end the space. Operating margin history for NVIDIA from 2001 to 2023. In 2001, they were just below 20%. And then it declined with the recession after the tech bubble burst to single digits and came close to 0%. Remained there for about a couple of years. Then I went back up, up to 20% again before the Great Recession. And with the Great Recession, it went as low as negative 16% operating margin. Then it went back up to 10 to 20% range for five years or so. With crypto, it surged above 20, above 30 all the way to 38%. And since then, it's been between 20 to 40%. Lately, it's actually been lower. In the last few quarters, operating margin for NVIDIA has been about 18%, below 20%. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Their gross margins are high, but now this is a third-party site. So kind of put the asterisk on there. I didn't go to the source here, but that's interesting. I would have expected their operating margins to be higher than that. Yeah, scratch that, scratch that source. According to Y charts, operating margin right now is the highest it's ever been. Above 40%. In the last decade, it's been about 20 to 30%. So that covers the crypto wave. Before that, however, it's about below 20%. And again, negative 16% after the Great Recession. So it's up about 10, 20% with these crypto and AI waves. Do you think it's ever going to decline below 20% again, Omar? The operating margin? Yeah, it, it could, yeah. Not you in think, the next quarter, but long term, sure. Do you think there's an AI bubble right now? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a shortage of AI training chips. There is a little bit of bubbliness going on. I mean, I would caution to call it a, a full bubble. You know, bubble is usually sort of something that actually has no merit. There is actually a lot of value being created here, but there's also a lot of hype and overexcitement and people kind of letting their imagination run a little wild. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of both. So for NVIDIA, we have high revenue growth driven by an imbalance in demand and supply leading to abnormally high gross margins and operating margins about double of what's historically normal for the company. And on top of that, we have an extremely high valuation multiples as well. So high valuation multiples combined with abnormally high profit margins and abnormally high revenue growth. Matt Senko says the valuations are close to irrational, but the market can stay irrational. Anyone shorting this so far has a sore butt. Henry says, ARM is the best way to play the AI bubble on the short side. Interesting. I don't know if the valuations are that ridiculous. I mean, the growth is so strong that the valuations honestly might still be kind of cheap. Like the cash flow is growing faster than the stock. Yeah. 
Yeah. But how far can that continue? What do you think will be a milestone or a headline or news that leads to a drop in NVIDIA stock price? Let's say more than 20%. Cloud service providers say their NVIDIA training cluster is underutilized. Right. If Microsoft says something like that, I, can, I think it could. And in, when I was reading the article, the article said Microsoft is going to start offering that chip uh, to customers next year. But the article was written Which in 2023. Exactly. The article was written in 2023. So next year means this year. But we haven't heard anything on that front, right? I mean, as far as the market knows, Microsoft is still soaking up as many H100s as it can get. Yeah. I mean, is this going to impact their H100 demand? Um, it's kind of too early to tell, but I imagine they'll kind of start going out this year, how they'll actually do, whether consumers will want them whether they'll really work as well as the NVIDIA chips. The jury's still out on that because we haven't seen it. But I expect them to continue with this effort. They're going to have a version 2 and a version 3 and a version 4. I mean, Google's on TPU version 5 already. So compute only goes in one direction. It only gets cheaper, and we only get more of it over time. So this isn't going to be something that maintains a 76% gross margin forever. That's pretty clear. Henry Abanto in live chat says, SoftBank was ready to dump ARM for $32 billion. It's now $150 billion with only 10% of the shares trading. Next month, lockup expires. Interesting. What does he mean by SoftBank was ready to dump ARM for $32 billion? Uh, they were trying to sell it. Really? Was and that? I think. I think they did. Or let me see what happened. Can't remember. Um, no, they actually. Yeah, they bought it. Um. Yeah, they bought the company. I think. Yeah, Japan SoftBank has agreed. This is 2016, July 2016. Japan SoftBank has agreed to acquire UK semiconductor firm Arm Holdings in a deal worth over 32 billion dollars. So what does he mean by that? UK blocked the deal, Henry says. Right, yeah. August 2023 article by CNBC says ARM files for NASDAQ listing as SoftBank aims to sell shares in chip designer it bought for $32 billion. ARM, which is owned by SoftBank, filed on Monday to list on the NASDAQ. The UK-based chip designer is looking to go public during a historically slow period for US IPOs. SoftBank agreed to acquire ARM for $32 billion in 2016. Yeah, I mean, that's a very strong indication. Thank you, Henry. Oh, look at this. July 2020. Barron's headline. NVIDIA reportedly in talks to buy ARM from SoftBank for $32 billion. That's what he means, probably. July 2020. There's a growing chatter that the graphics chip giant NVIDIA is taking a serious run at buying the UK-based semiconductor design firm Arm Holdings from SoftBank, which had acquired the Arm in 2016 for $32 billion. Wow, can you imagine? NVIDIA could have been $100 billion more today if that deal went through. Yeah. 
Matt Sanko says, and Henry also says it was about $40 billion. So ARM is today $150 billion market cap. So NVIDIA could have added even more, not to mention that maybe it would have allowed higher prices for H100s if that deal had gone through. Henry says they stopped the deal because NVIDIA would have had too much insight into AI design pipeline with ARM tech. Not just AI, but any design with ARM IP, actually. Thank you very much, everybody. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. Take care.